Hey, everybody, welcome to the 21st annual uh, SF Indie Fest. Um, things are a little bit uh, different this year. Um, as we all know, we've kind of lived through, uh, we're living in a weird world. Um, when um, our founder, Jeff Ross, started the festival 21 years ago, I don't think that he ever thought uh, that um, we'd be doing this virtually. Uh, but over the last few months, we kind of got a hang of it with some of our other festivals. And um, we've kind of seen ourselves as kind of an alternative to uh, all this Netflix binging that so many of us are doing. Um, so today um, we have a really great uh, opportunity to have a Q&A with filmmaker Mo Scarpelli, uh, who is the director of El Father Plays himself. Uh, Mo, welcome. <laughs> Thanks again uh, for being back. For those of you that have followed SF Indie Fest over the years, we've had um, we've been lucky enough to screen two of our previous films, um, Ambessa a year or two ago, and then uh, Frame by Frame back in uh, 2014. And so it's always kind of exciting to see where our alumni filmmakers, um, what sort of ideas they have in their head and then excitedly be able to kind of share them with our audiences. Um, you know, the films that you make have kind of been set in so many different kind of far flung places around the world. I mean, so often documentary filmmakers um, wind up kind of revisiting the same places over and over again or filming in their own backyard, but you've wound up in Ethiopia for Ambessa and Afghanistan for uh, Frame by Frame and uh, now with El Father Plays Himself, Venezuela. Um, so how do you wind up kind of choosing stories in these places and what do you think that attracts you to um, the kind of characters and um, subjects that you explore? Yeah, I have um, a quite a it's a weird thing that I made films in three different places. Actually, when you list them like, like one by one, um, they're places that while I'm making the film even experience very chaotic economic crisis in Venezuela, a social uh, political crisis in Ethiopia and in Afghanistan, a uh, all out war, obviously all of us know. And so obviously the, the I'm, I'm interested in places where attention or, or times even, the time of a person's life or, or the setting of their life or something they're undergoing is kind of applying a very particular pressure to them where they have to, uh, where in living and surviving through this thing, um, I say surviving in a kind of about psychological things because you know, even in frame by frame, I didn't spend a lot of time on the front lines of war talking about you know surviving bombs and things like that. It's more psychologically how we cope with the world around us no matter what's going on. Um, that's what I'm drawn to. So I'm kind of interested in, in, in points of people's lives or, or activities they're doing or events they're going through or, or places they're experiencing that kind of uh, push them to what I feel when I know the character, um, they're ready for uh, a kind of uh, catharsis. And then uh, that's why I like making observational films is that I want to be there and it's my task really just to listen and watch as much as possible and try to interpret who they are and what that means about, about you, about me, about all of us, because they're, they're taking on something uh, very unique for their own lives. And so, you know, with uh, this kind of newest film that we're getting a chance to share, El Father Plays Himself, what was it that um, you knew there was kind of a story to be told? I mean, Obviously, film sets are inherently dramatic, and you know when you're filming in the middle of the jungle, you know, you're you know there's probably going to be tensions rise, especially with the family dynamics. Um, what was kind of attracted you, like, hey, I want to go on this ride? Yeah, well, I was invited. Well, I kind of invited myself along to Venezuela in the first place, but but Jorge, the director of uh, the film that I follow, he's my partner as well, and he knows that. I mean, he he met me through film festivals. He knows my work, obviously. And he was like, you're going to be crazy bored in Venezuela if you're not making something. Do you want to shoot our making of? And so, yes. And I mean, immediately I was thinking of what you said. Of course, there's going to be this drama. It reminded me, of, I love Les Blank's film, Burden of Dreams, about Werner Herzog making Fitzgerald. Mm. So I thought, okay, maybe I can make something in the vein of that. But my real inquiry was always kind of when I really look back was when I first met Jorge and he told me about the film he was working on with his father and he said his plan was to have his father play himself and then he went on to tell me all about his father uh, having problems with alcoholism and being a, just a very uh, sporadic emotional man and I was thinking not just about him being an exciting character father but 
thinking, what would I do if like, you know, my son came back, he doesn't live in Venezuela anymore. And he comes back to me and he says, you know, play your own role in front of a camera and do it, but do it my way, you know? And Jorge's not really like uh, one of those directors who's like, do it my way. But I just wondered what is the tension there? And I've seen, I have two brothers with a father and I have my own relationship with my mother. And I know there's always these unsaid things. Our whole lives we go not saying so many things and hurting each other or being there for each other because we protect each other by not saying these things, blah, blah, blah. Family is a really, really dynamic place to explore what is intrinsic, but not necessarily explained. You know, I don't really trust words anyway so much when it comes to people's relationships. I like to watch them be. Um, so initially I'm thinking, well, okay, this film is gonna actually make all the unsaid things come to life in some way. I didn't anticipate it to be so strong, to be honest. Um, but then also when I met father, became very captivated by this type of person who likes to go on the edge of a tapui, uh, the mountains of Venezuela and look over it, you know, and the, even in the archival footage I found of him. And he's, he's someone who wants to push things very far. And then his son did too. And so from there on, it was once I realized that dynamic was there um, and the father's the kind of person who actually spends a lot of time of, or a lot of his energy on, on getting on the edge of things uh, to push himself. And he was ready for this catharsis that I say, I kind of look for that a person's going through. Then the film really just had to become all about, about that. So that's really what I, what I focused on. Yeah, well, that's an interesting way to capture, you know, both kind of, uh, you know, family dynamics, but also kind of uh, your approach to filmmaking here. It does make me wonder, um, you know, there's always this question of like, you know, you know, with we as filmmakers, when we're particularly documentary filmmakers, is that just the presence of the camera, how does it change it? And here you have it doubled up in the sense that, you know, this fiction film, you know, that um, obviously, um, you know, a father is, you know, encouraged to kind of channel things. But do you think that, this situation that kind of created itself is that because it was being documented, not that people were performing for the camera, but it kind of gave people permission to even be, to kind of release themselves more. I mean, like, what do you think your presence in making the film, how do you think it kind of shaped the framework with which these things were happening? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that that's actually where I became on a personal level, even more captivated by making this film and where I became even more invested in making it because I had experienced an Mbesa. I mean, frame by frame, my first film was with four adults who are photographers. So they're very, it was kind of like shooting with people who kind of understood this trust mm. that you need to have with the people you're shooting with. So it was actually quite unique in that way. It was like, uh, we had pretty quick access. And, um, and I look back at that film after making it and wish that I had a way to know you know to explore more the the use of the camera as in their in their profession their lives too the mm. use of the camera and the way it alters reality and the way that it soothes reality or 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 helps them form identity or whatever in Ambesa it was interesting because I saw myself as this child in the film I become his ally by hanging out with him um, but not because I'm around and because I'm older or because I'm cool or because I'm special or as a person simply because I have a camera and I'm watching him and mm. no one in his life watches him really that closely. Very few people watch anyone in, in life that closely. I mean, I was like this, you know, watching this kid. Yeah. But he needed an ally in the world, but not someone who's going to sit there and say, wow, you're so brilliant. Cause a lot of people do that. Not someone like his mother is going to, you know, she's his mother. It's different. He kind of needed, or in that case wanted, I don't know if he needed it. He wanted, and then it became a relationship with this camera between us to be seen. Uh, and whether I was, what I was gonna do with the film is almost separate from that. The process of making it was important to him to be seen and to feel he had an ally watching all of his, you know, shattered moments or his beautiful moments or just going on these weird fantastical adventures and things. So I became really interested in that, you know, the way that my camera or the way that me as a kind of disembodied person or something behind this thing, just watching, just the act of watching, we've talked about a lot in journalism and in filmmaking, altering people that they start performing. But I, I think that's true, but I also think that we're always performing and that with the camera there, we're almost kind of tapping into our, once we get used to it, we're always kind of tapping into maybe something about where there's almost a mirror there, where we just see ourselves in the mirror all the time. We're always kind of checking ourselves, even if 
they're not looking at the camera, looking at me for my reaction. Just the fact of being filmed and being watched by someone you trust makes you aware, self-aware. And so I wanted to take that further in a father and to the point where I'm kind of hoping at least that when people watch the film that they see that I'm looking at the camera as itself as a mechanism, the one that Jorge used and mine and how father interacts with it and how we interact with it and how he uses me against Jorge sometimes and vice versa. And so I think that that's really interesting because that at the end of the day, father actually has the control. We have the cameras, we're the directors, we make the films. But in that moment, in those moments, father kind of has the control to say, I choose this camera. No, I like the way she does it. No, I like this, you know, and I like that. I kind of like that interrogation. No, you have say, and I think that does come across. I mean, uh, one thing that did, um, once I kind of understood a little bit of um, your, uh, you know, you know, your background or uh, relationship with Jorge, um, I was wondering at some point in time, did you ever feel like, like, I just need to set the camera down, you know, it's like, you know, here's somebody that I care about, you know? <laughs> and, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was a bit worried because he's so composed. I was, and I know very much the thing yeah. for hurting him because he'll tell me, but also because I know, because I know him beyond the camera, being able to watch his face. And that was a big worry of mine up until this magical day um, that Fagwa is uh, the acting coach who works with Father and works mm. with Jorge. And Fagwa had to leave for part of the production. So he missed the day that they did that really intense scene where father's yelling in the phone and they get drunk and all this stuff. And that was a very intense thing, not just for father, but for Jorge too. But in my watching Jorge, it doesn't, I mean, it comes across that he sees things and that he's feeling things, but he's so composed that I, I, I was worried up until Basically, after that, I, I started to become very stressed out. Oh no, I mean, he looks like he might look like a monster. You know, his dad is so emotional and he's so composed that he might mm. look like this cool, uh, manipulative person. Even though I'm watching him as closely as I can, like, it's just going to maybe come off that way. I need a conversation where he actually like struggles with this. And luckily, like I said, this Fagwa had gone away and he, when he came back, I was like, go watch this footage with Jorge in the room. And like, I'd like lock me in there with you guys. I just want to see what happens. And that's what they did. And this conversations really came up and Jorge started mm. to express doubt, you know, about the film. And I think that those kind of happy accidents are very good for observational documentary because I can't, I like the form. I was married to this form for this film. It was a task, a challenge. I didn't want to use interviews. I wanted to observe and I wanted to, you know, observe cameras observing and really use the whole thing to kind of play with with what was happening and um, and so it was really and and to and to speak as honestly as to what was happening because uh, there was a lot going on and I just wanted the audience to watch it uh, yeah. and interpret a lot of things for themselves. So anyway, it, I'm really lucky for little things like that, but it, it was somewhat of a worry because I mean, obviously, I love my partner. I don't want, but at the same time. So the other thing that's interesting about me and Jorge is we both make films and we both challenge each other a lot, you know? <laughs> so because he was challenging his father to play the role and I was watching this happen, he was he was kind of, you know, he and his father have this kind of machismo thing too. Of like, I can handle it, I can handle it. He's, I'm like, <laughs> well then can you handle this? He's like, yeah, I can handle it, you know? So it's like <laughs> each of us pushing each other and kind of go like like into a ball and like rolling off the cliff <laughs> is what it's all like. But, um, but that was good. It was very healthy, actually, because that's just how we are. We really are like that anyway as individuals. Okay. So I got to kind of exercise it in making a film. <laughs> well, I think, you know, um, you know, the observational quality of the film definitely kind of helps us um, just kind of take the time to kind of um, sit and marinate in these situations. And I think that, um, you know, some of these shots are so kind of meditative that, you know, you know, you could see like, when watching it, you're like, oh, I could see how like a reality TV show would do this totally different, you know, but like <laughs> just the kind of um, the kind of emotions that you see, you know, on people's faces or times, it's like, I think that that patience, you know, is kind of rewarded in understanding these people um, in the experience kind of more deeply. Um, I'm sure one of the things that people be kind of curious about is that, um, you know, going in and deciding to make the fiction film rather than the documentary film, um, you know, both son and father, uh, probably the experience was, you know, different in some ways than they expected. And so I'm sure they've both seen uh, your documentary by now and like, what's their kind of reaction and takeaway 
to it? And does it make them feel uncomfortable or um, does it provide some insight that they didn't quite expect or? Yeah, yeah, it does. And it, it evolves actually. So the first time that we watched the films, we watched, we went back to Venezuela and we watched both films with, with father. Uh, and that was a bit hard for him because he saw, he knows already how he behaves. Um, hmm. He's been doing it his whole life. He's very self-aware actually, father. I think that's really, that's, that's one of the hardest things about being him is that he's super intelligent and self-aware and also self-destructive. So it's like, he can't <laughs> really forget that he is that way. So I know right. he knew. And that's why I never had any real doubts about editing the film or including, there were times that I found myself trying to protect him from others' uh, judgment because I know he can get quite wild, but I know all those things that are coming from a really important place, a valid place, even if he's drunk when they're happening. So basically when he saw the film though, I think it was hard for him to see his son's face I think it was hard for him. He, when he's in the moment doing these things that he's not proud of, he never stops and gazes at his son's disappointment, you know, or his son's okay, right, sadness. Yeah. Because none of us can, because that's nobody, you know, like that's not how we see their face, like on the <laughs> side, like looking at you. So anyway, I think that was, that was quite difficult. I mean, he said so. But then as time has gone, and Jorge, you know, has seen the film, he wasn't, I didn't show him a cut until very late in the edit. And and then he was watching the film and then he saw it with an audience and he saw it with an audience again with his other film and his Q and A, when we do a Q and A together, it's kind of like a very psychological, psychoanalysis kind of like, you know, for him because it's such a personal thing, both films. But it's really interesting because the use of this film, I, I hoped, my biggest hope for us was that the use of it would evolve over time. Maybe now it's, uh, everything's very present. We miss being on the shoot, but also it was really intense. So it's very heavy, but you know, maybe five years from now we'll watch it and we'll see, oh, okay, that's how I, but actually father like a week ago or two weeks ago was like, send me the link. I want to watch it again. He's been in actually a rehabilitation oh, wow. center. Yeah. And he's been, he had, he had shown it to his, uh, his, uh, what's it called? Like psychologist at the rehabilitation mm -hmm. center already. So they, they knew what he'd been through and like, um, but then he watched it anew recently saying, no, I want to see myself in it. And I was like, wow, this is already happening. This kind of evolution <laughs> of being able to use the film for something. I don't know what, I'm not going to say it's like a cure or anything, but I do think it distills time. Mm. And I think that that part of, of any, of any documentary is really important. Um, and, and I think that's really important for me even because I, I remember watching frame by frame two years after I made it and I just, Stayed. I went in for a sound mix at a festival and or to make sure the sound was okay and I found myself just standing there watching the entire film standing in the back and it was <laughs> because I just missed these people I miss them they're my friends and I'm not with them anymore and I think that sometimes we make films also just we we actually want to distill things uh not just to share them with others but we kind of do it for ourselves you know like so that we can always have that place that moment that thing we did that person we got so close to in that time forever yeah. That part is really cool. Well, and also, yeah, the obviously the relationships or friendships that you build in those situations. It's uh, it's nice to be able to, uh, to kind of go back on that journey um, mm -hmm. and you know, see who you were and who they were at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I knew uh, we'll need to wrap up here in a minute or two, but um, I would be remiss without me asking, you know, I mean, you're filming in the jungle, you know, uh, any particular uh, filmmaker war story or kind of challenge of kind of film? We've talked about the psychological difficulties of making a film like this uh, or some of the physical uh, challenges that uh, one might encounter in doing this. Yeah, actually some people, when they watch the film, they, they want to see more of the kind of making of because they veer away from that to really focus on father and son. Um, and I have a lot of making of footage that's like disastrous. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I was there with the guys before, with the, with the crew before they shot the film, they had gotten, tried to get access to the location where father actually had his real tourist camp in the past. And they mm. wanted to shoot like where father really spent his time in the jungle in the nineties. And, um, and then they got kicked out of that area with this like crazy story where people thought that they are Colombian casting director was like stealing women and selling them as like sex oh, wow. trafficking women. It was like rumors going in the jungle the way that Les Blank talks about in um, if it's in um, Burden of Dreams. 
So there was that kind of thing with like utter disappointment. They lost location and they got a new one. Then they, uh, there was all kinds of stuff of like, but the probably the most obvious one that's like crazy is that, and it's crazy. It's not in the movie, but it just didn't fit. <laughs> it's in the extra. Mm-hmm. Is that there was the, the boat that they take, the little canoes that they take with the motor on the back and that you see in a father. Those are the primary way to get around uh, with the film gear. And so one day on the river, on these really fast current moving dangerous rivers, some of them with waterfalls very close, very high waterfalls. Luckily we weren't on one of those. Oh, wow. um, they're passing the river, crossing the river in the dark at night after shooting an amazing scene. They have all the gear packed into the, the cuillara, it's called the canoe, and it starts to sink. And the crew, we just start hearing screaming and we're luckily, me and Father and Jorge and, the, and a bunch of crew are on the bank, the river bank, but the DP, the camera, all the, sh- all the material, everything that they shot is like in with a bunch of lenses. Everything is in the canoe that is now sinking into the Amazon and like things are going off in the water <laughs> and the crew is like wearing boots. And so they're sinking in the water and they were like gonna drown. It was like crazy. So they sent another canoe out and they rescued everybody. And luckily nobody got hurt and the camera was okay, even though it, there was water leakage in it. They had to send new lens in from Caracas, all this stuff. Because once you lose a battery in the jungle, you know, you have to helicopter it in. It's like <laughs> so this was, this was an intense, insane, uh, insane time, you know? It's crazy to even think about surviving that. The, the DP <laughs> has an incredible story of just like thinking and like, yeah, I died for the movie. <laughs> Oh man. Well, I, I think you've made a wonderful film and I, I'd love to see a trilogy of uh, this and Burden of Dreams and Hearts of Darkness at some point in time. Yeah. Uh, uh, these documentaries about, um, uh, you know, uh, a friend or partner <laughs> making a fiction film in the jungle, you know. Yeah, um, quite a genre now. <laughs> um, well, thanks again for sharing the film with us. And I guess, um, what is the best way for you know us and our audience to um, continue to follow you and share word about this film, but also uh, the fiction film if they want to kind of have an opportunity to watch it at some point in time? Yeah, the best way to know about all these things is we now have a website. We recently got a wonderful distribution fund from the Torino Film Lab, which is great. Congratulations. So we're distributing the film ourselves in this crazy year where it's impossible to do distribution. Um, but we'll have a release in the US, but also in all territories, really, at some point, they just are going to be at different times. Hmm. So the best way to kind of keep up with that is to go to the website, which is just the title, lfatherplayshimself.com. And if you sign up for the email updates, we only send them out to tell you when the film comes to your territory. So you pick your country, hmm. like a new one, um, or your state or whatever. So then the other, um, the other thing is just that we have, we also have a Facebook page. If you search uh, Father Plays Doc on Instagram, on Facebook and Twitter, that's a good way to follow along. In fact, for small films like this, it helps if you post and tag us, we're happy to like re-say what you think of the film, you know, repost it. That's really nice sometimes. Um, and then I don't really use social media that much, but I, when I do, I use uh, Twitter somewhat. So just my name on Twitter, Mo Scarpelli. Um, is maybe a good way to get a hold of me. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you again for sharing and everybody, you know, um, you know, the best thing you can do is kind of uh, after watching the film and seeing this Q&A, share, talk about it in social media or, um, you know, on Zoom with friends and, um, you know, the filmmakers out there um, share their films with us so we can kind of help spread word. Uh, so when the film hits, um, you know, other places around the world, people will be aware of it. So uh, let's be this kind of grassroots team to kind of uh, get word out about a father who plays himself. And um, thanks again, Mo, and we'll be looking forward to welcoming back to SF Indie Fest in the future. Thank Take you. <laughs> Bye. Cool. And...